Institute of Latin American Studies at UT Austin. Um, today we have our faculty uh, book presentation series, and I am very, very excited to welcome professors Alan Covey and Jorge Cañizares Esguerra, who will be discussing Professor Alan Covey's most recent book, Inca Apocalypse, the Spanish Conquest and the Transformation of the Andean World, um, a book that revisits uh, the long durée history of the conquest, uh, that symbolic moment when Francisco Pizarro captured Atahualpa at Cajamarca, and how we can revisit the, the, the history of Peru from a different lens. Um, Alan Covey is professor of anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin, um, and he's also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. His research addresses the development and organization of ancient empires with particular focus on the Incas of Andean South America. Um, he has conducted archeological surveys and excavations to collect data on the rise and fall of the Incas and work extensively in archives in Peru and Europe to construct a richer understanding of the impact of early modern European expansion in the Andean world something that he also treats in this book. Professor Jorge Cañizares Esguerra is the Alice Dreisdale Sheffield Professor of History um, at UT Austin. His research um, encompasses uh, many subjects. Uh, he's well known for his research in early modern Atlantic history, the history of science and colonialism, the history of knowledge and colonial Spanish and British America. Um, he will be commenting uh, Alan's book after uh, Alan's presentation on it. Thank you so much to both of you and welcome to the audience. Thank you, Adela. And I'd, I'd like to thank Lilas for the invitation to present this book and uh, also Paloma Diaz for all the work to set it up. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's that's shown up in the audience and, and folks that have come to, to uh, I thank Jorge for, for uh, being willing to give comments and, and other folks that, that have come um, uh, to just join that conversation. I'm going to uh, start with about a 30 minute presentation. I'm gonna begin with, uh, I have some slides that I wanted to, to use to accompany this. Uh, so let me start that show and what I wanted to run through was sort of where this book, came, how this book came into being. Well, maybe move to an overview of what I I'd like to talk about. Uh, how did this book come to be? Uh, what is it trying to do? Uh, and, and I think uh, to a certain extent, we can talk later. Does it do a good job at all of these things? It is a book that um, um, I, I, I feel like it was going down a rabbit hole of sorts uh, when, when I got started with it. And there's so much to be said and so many ideas. Um, but kind of talking about what, what I was trying to engage with in, in putting the book together, doing the research. Uh, for, I, I wanted to say a little bit about just the organization of the book and some key themes that, that developed as, as I wrote. And then talk a little bit about what this meant for me, the, the, you know, what I'm working on right now, uh, having come out of that book on the other side and saying, you know, what do I want to know more about? Uh, what, what, what are some interesting ideas? So I want to start at the beginning and um, uh, obviously Genesis is, is the very beginning. There's something very biblical and mythological and very value laden about the uh, European invasion of the Andes. And there's a huge literary legacy that one has to confront when writing about it. Um, it was 2014 when I talked to an editor at Oxford University Press, uh, Stefan Branca. He was editing, uh, uh, overseeing the Oxford Handbook of the Incas that Sonia Alcanini and I were editing. And, and that was a project that um, I think it, it made him curious about when the, the story of the conquest of, of the Andes had been updated? Was there an academic book that, that, had, um, uh, that, that was current and that was, that was useful? And I talked to him and said, well, 
you know, th th there, are, there, are th there are great books out there, uh, but, but some of them are farther in the past than others. So we have Prescott's book um, from 1847. And, and that was a, a point, as I was thinking about this book, that was an important moment for me to understand the writing and rediscovery of the Incas in the 19th century and how uh, entangled that became with scientific racism and colonial empires and some of the disciplinary claims that, that scholars uh, started to, to latch onto and to apply to the Incas. Um, Hemings' book is obviously a masterwork. And, and there, there, so there was something with these, uh, if you look at these two books, um, Prescott spent a huge amount of time talking about the Incas before the conquest, what, what people thought they knew. Uh, there wasn't a lot of archaeology then. The ethnohistory was, and the chronicles were still just being rediscovered and, and printed. Um, but there's a lot about the Incas before Cajamarca, before the, the uh, Europeans got there. Uh, and Hemings is a different book, and he was very clear in 1970 that he gets to Cajamarca in just a few pages because he wanted to talk about the indigenous struggle against European colonialism. And in some ways that, that was something that uh, I wanted, to, I, I, in thinking about doing a book, uh, at first it was super intimidating uh, to think about being in conversation with, with works like this, uh, but also trying not to either replicate and reproduce narratives without thinking about them critically, but also trying not to uh, walk along the very same path that, that some other writers have, have covered. Now, the story of Cajamarca is not just a story of Inca studies. And I, I put a, a kind of schematic diagram here to say there are a lot of stories, there are a lot of stakeholders, there are a lot of uh, values and a lot of ideas. And trying to fit this story within Inca studies, but as close to that overlapping uh, of all of these different kinds of narratives uh, where you have like Kim McQuarrie's uh, uh, book, uh, which would fit into popular history. Um, this was something that I, I think was one of the big challenges and, and kind of a hard thing to approach. Uh, I, I remember uh, when I put a, the, the, the uh, book prospectus together, there was a historian who reviewed it and said, I, I don't really know what an archeologist is going to bring to this project we don't really like to write these kinds of books in history. Uh, uh, th this isn't our kind of book doing a conquest book. And, and so it was, it was also acknowledging that th this, this has been a kind of place where, where there's some risk to telling the story at a certain scale. There's a risk, um, certainly in the secondary literature, uh, of, of not uh, getting enough on, on, uh, in, in the different constituent bibliographies. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it's Janet Abu Lugod's book uh, on um, the, the kind of uh, late medieval world. And she talks about doing a book like that, you're constantly transgressing other people's fields. Uh, you're stepping into this world of nuance and of extraordinarily dedicated scholarship. And there's always this knowledge that you're going to miss some of the citations, you're going to miss some of that detail and nuance. And, and so that was something that... Um, at the outset, uh, there, there was a need to kind of orient the book. One thing that I didn't feel comfortable and confident doing was to try and make it a book on Peruvian history. And, and there are, there's a, a whole other historiographic tradition. Uh, the, the story of Peru, especially putting the Incas and the arrival of the Spaniards into a national history um, is, is its own genre. And, and so for me, I was, I was really mindful, um, for better or worse, of writing for an English speaking audience, uh, and all the problems and all the limitations that come with that, 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 um, that, that it, it meant uh, often trying to direct readers to English editions of things. Um, and, and, it, and it meant that there, there were some elements of the story that were emphasized over others. Uh, one of them being an apocalypticism. Uh, I think of that as a, as a very distinctively American uh, idea. And in the introduction of the book, I point out that in the 20th century, 21st century, sorry, um, almost half of Americans when polled think that Jesus will come back by the middle of the century. Uh, most Americans believe in angels. Most Americans believe in demonic possession. And so some of these things to say, we're, we remain, uh, we're not as disenchanted 
as the kind of enlightenment philosophy might have us say, and, and, and we remain entangled in some, some of the elements of this story that sometimes get glossed over in, in the scholarly treatment, that we sometimes, you know, when the Spaniards are talking about um, surviving the Inca siege of Cusco, uh, we, we don't take at face value that they say that uh, Santiago, the apostle, appeared on a horse and, and fought alongside them. Uh, or that the Virgin Mary appeared and, and put out fires that the Incas were setting on the buildings where the Spaniards were sheltering. Uh, so this was something, it, 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 it's not intended to be inaccessible uh, to, to people outside of an English audience, but, but, it, but it had a particular uh, emphasis. Um, and I want to move now to some things that I thought I could bring to the book uh, since the last, to me, the last great book, which I, I would say the great uh, work of, of uh, Hemming in 1970. And that's as an archaeologist to say archaeology has changed the picture of Inca origins. It's changed the picture of the Inca empire. Uh, we can actually see places where uh, colonial Inca narratives are not in accordance with the material record. So when the Incas are claiming to be threatened by groups like the Chanca or, or the Koya of, of the, the Lake Titicaca Basin, uh, the archaeology of those regions says these are these are village societies. They're not expansionist states or empires. Um, so one of the things archaeology tells us a lot more about where the Incas came from and and um, some of the limits of their power uh, and some of the places where the Incas were still struggling uh, to create an empire. So uh, a lot of what what has been maybe taken as historical in the colonial chronicles was aspirational, uh, was Inca noblemen saying, our, Inca, our, our, our ancestors owned this, our ancestors did this, people never questioned us. And so it allowed us, allowed me in doing the work uh, to think about some of the truth claims on the Inca side uh, as, as being um, aspirational, just like I wanted to treat some of the, you know, the claims that Spaniards were making about their place in the Andes and what happened as uh, driven by their values and their strategies and often misrepresented uh, to, to those ends. Um, so some of the things, uh, if you look when Prescott wrote in, in the 1840s, there were almost no sites known in the Cusco region. And, and this is a map of his, uh, when he went down the, the Sacred Valley uh, into the Yukai area, he put you know, two or three different Inca ruins on that map. Uh, today, uh, uh, thanks to uh, people like Brian Bauer and Steve Kosiba and survey work that I've done uh, with our Peruvian colleagues, um, we, we've registered over 3,000 archaeological sites in the Cusco region. We can link the Incas to the period of uh, earlier states and empires, which is something that Incas denied ever existed in the Andes. They said they were the only civilization ever to emerge. And then in the provinces, uh, we can see that there are vast areas where you don't see the Incas, you don't see Inca style architecture or Inca uh, material culture in local communities. And the places that local people were summoned to, to interact with the Incas have these kind of local signatures to them. And so, so this was for me to say, you know, it's easy when people tell the story of Cajamarca to say, Atahualpa was the unquestioned lord of the entire western part of South America, but he wasn't. Uh, not only did the Spaniards know that he wasn't the unquestioned lord, but the, the power that he claimed uh, wasn't sufficient to extend to all, all people in the Andes. People were resisting it, people had strategies for dealing with it, and the Spaniards walked into uh, both that state project, state making project, and, and the local strategies for, for either aligning with it, resisting it, bypassing it, uh, or, 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 or um, other things that, that local people might have thought to do. So I wanted to do a more intersectional approach also. Uh, so in the, especially in the 1980s with work by uh, uh, Irene Silverblatt, uh, other Andean ethnographers, uh, feminist scholarship has told a story of the overthrow of female power. And, and this was something to me that I, I really thought needed a, a, an even more active voice of saying uh, there are female directed institutions, 
there are women that are, as, as I say, the, the, the tenth Koya or Inca Empress, uh, Mama Oklio, I just I describe in the book as the most powerful person in the Americas uh, at one point. Uh, and and then that that power is subverted and overthrown. Uh, the powerful women that make their own alliances and pursue their own strategies in the 1530s are literally written out of uh, the Inca dynasty as it becomes more patrilineal and as they don't have the spaces in the Spanish administrative uh, system uh, to represent themselves. So, so the regendering, uh, the conquest of Andean women was, was something that I really wanted to look at uh, in the book. Race was something that, that to me, I, I also wanted to keep in mind. And, and this, this was something that um, trying to tell a story that's a little more complicated than conquistadors and Incas uh, to understand that the people coming from Europe are or with Europeans. Uh, the Europeans came with a lot of people of African heritage, uh, Central American uh, uh, indigenous people. And, and the Incas weren't a unified group either, that, that there are uh, a lot of different local and ethnic groups that were pursuing different kinds of strategies. And that as we move into the colonial period, the, the mixing of these groups and the, the kind of recalibration of their strategies and identities is a huge part of the story. Uh, something that if we look at the span, what, we, what are called kind of the Spanish civil wars of the 1540s and 1550s, hundreds of people in those armies are Afro-Peruvians that are fighting for their freedom and fighting for recognition in, in, a, in, a, in this evolving colonial world. Uh, and, and so that was something, the, the idea that the Spaniard, uh, uh, people that are, th that are still kind of new to thinking of themselves as Spaniards uh, are doing this kind of uh, imperial race making uh, as, as the project goes along. They want, they want to see whether they could fit the Incas into a quote, Indian world. Um, and the Incas were trying not to be fit into that. They were trying to retain um, the, the, their identity and privilege uh, apart from uh, other, other Andean people. And then you can't do uh, race, class, gender without class. Uh, and, and this is something, the idea that uh, the, the um, rupture between Inca factionalism and the, the period of Spanish administrative intensification, which is about 50, almost 50 years maybe, um, brings with it all of these different groups of different statuses. So where it's possible to have uh, Inca nobles that are married to the Spanish elite. In fact, in the book, I trace the Inca and Coya lines until they disappear into the Spanish nobility, where we have a, the, the woman, a woman living in Spain who claims the name of Coya, who's married into the, the uh, families of uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and the Borgias going back to uh, the Pope that divided the world up between uh, Spain and Portugal in, in the 1490s. Uh, and this was something too that the Spaniards, uh, uh, rather than treating Spaniards as encomenderos or conquistadores, um, to also say there are a lot of lower status Spaniards on the landscape. There are a lot of people that are flowing into this area. There are Europeans from other parts of, of Europe that may or may not have permission to be in the Andes, uh, that there are a lot of people on this landscape uh, doing things that are legal, that are illegal, that are definitely not good um, in, in, in the overall arc. Um, but but I, I wanted to, to, to treat this as um, you know, a, 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 a world in the making in which, for example, uh, the, the pictures on the left, uh, the two pictures on the left, an Inca noble might find himself mistrusting another indigenous noble because of his uh, ties to indigenous feasting practices and traditional drinking, uh, whereas his identity is built on uh, that of a, of a, a, a good Christian uh, subject of, of the, the King of Spain. And then the two pictures on the right where the encomendero doesn't necessarily share a uh, common cause with the poor soldier that came in hoping to get a reward, hoping to make it rich and ends up in this picture from Juan Antoba as a bandit, uh, accosting indigenous people and stealing from them. Um, now all of these people uh, from the perspective of the Spanish crown were concerns in terms of administration. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so this is kind of a, a book in, in the sort of, uh, 
I, from you know, inspired from work by people like uh, Restall uh, to say uh, we also need to move past this idea that um, the Spanish Empire is a modern civilization and the Incas are the last un untouched uh, ancient or native civilization. These metaphorical approaches. Um, we, we have to kind of treat, and I wanted to treat the, uh, the Iberian world and the Andean world uh, in parallel at the beginning to, to, uh, to, to say you know, that the, the states that are developing in both regions uh, share some similar attitudes. They have some, some similar strategies, even though they also have some very distinctive ways uh, that they're, um, they're approaching the world and its end. Um, and I, I think uh, not treating the Spanish conquest as the arrival of some sort of colonial administration, uh, but, but rather seeing it as uh, repeatedly seeing the Spanish crown admit that we're unable to keep tabs on the people that we sent there. We're unable to make sure the officials do the, what we're saying that they're going to do. Uh, we're unable to be everywhere that we need to be in order to do the kind of governing that we're claiming a, a moral and philosophical right to do. And, and so the, this uh, discussion of sovereignty um, and uh, the claims to it as, as being claims uh, that, um, uh, that, that that were affecting the, the narratives that, that were um, uh, being written down in the, the 16th century. And, and then I think the last part was um, uh, looking at Spanish empire building in the Americas, not as this hemispheric success but as a place that failed over and over again, that, that the Spaniards came into the Inca world and with the help of the Incas and other Andean lords, they reconstituted parts of that empire, but they also failed to move beyond them and they failed to hold a lot of them. Uh, and, and having a story, uh, the Jesuit writer, uh, Jose de Acosta, I was writing in, in 1590, um, where he said, we got into the Andes because we were good Christians. And we've kind of lost our way there and we haven't had any successes. We haven't done well in Chile. We haven't done well in Brazil. Uh, we're not doing well in the, uh, to, the, to the north of Mexico. Uh, we're locked in these frontier wars. And I wanted to kind of tell that story where, where rather than seeing this as a victory of the West, uh, that this is the beginning of a, a centuries long resistance, uh, you know, places in Chile, uh, that were standing up to the Incas uh, continued to fight uh, until after there was no longer a Spanish empire in, 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 uh, in that part of the world. And then that kind of gets me, all of these things confronting the, the myths of the conquest, um, this became a kind of, uh, the, the Jared Diamond's uh, book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you, you see the, the cover photo treats Cajamarca as this watershed moment in world history. Uh, so the Incas become a metaphor of Western dominance. They become the pivot point where, where he's saying, look what literacy can do for you. Uh, look what metallurgy, iron metallurgy can do for you. And just to kind of give you a point, one reason I felt a need to, to uh, not necessarily lock horns with it throughout, but to think about it. Uh, is that it's, it remains extraordinarily influential. Uh, and, and this is as of a few days ago, the citations on Google Scholar, um, it, it has you know, more than 10 times the citation uh, of uh, than a, a work by Hemming. And this is, a, that, I think that's a problem is that the, the uptake of Diamond's work has used the Incas and used this, uh, some of the, this uh, Western mythology uh, to in a way that's been convincing beyond anthropology, beyond often beyond the social sciences and into areas that people aren't necessarily as sensitive to just how contingent and and uh, uh, th th this this conquest really was. So I worked on this book for for a couple of years uh, from 2014 and uh, and as the slide says, it came out in 2018. Uh, the perfect story for to read while waiting for your mail to come out of the microwave. <laughs> the, the, the story of uh, a pandemic hit superpower that, that gets factionalized, that falls into violence and despair and a feeling of the end of the world. Um, not really uh, the, the kind of uh, bedroom read for people that already aren't sleeping at night, but that, that's the mo that is its moment. And maybe it's a book of its moment uh, in that sense. It certainly wasn't designed <laughs> 
uh, to fit into uh, the, the year that, that it came out in. Um, but let me talk really quickly, and I, I, I want to just see time-wise. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, just the organization of the book, I'll, I'll, I'll give, just spend a few minutes on, on the basic flow of, of what it does, uh, talk about a few themes, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so I, I opened up um, in the 19th century. Uh, and, and that was something where I wanted to talk about uh, modern studies of the Incas, such as Prescott's, uh, but grounded in a per the period of colonial empire building, um, scientific racism especially, because some of the people that are uh, discovering the Incas are looking for skulls to measure, uh, to, to uh, so uh, collecting skulls for people like Samuel Morton, who writes his own version of Inca history uh, in, in his, his account of um, uh, uh, human cranial typology. Um, and, and, and this is something I carried for it all the way up into the 1890s um, with the, the uh, Columbian Exposition in New York uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, the kind of, um, just the rediscovery of the Incas in text, in bodies, uh, and in sites like Machu Picchu. So the idea that the Incas, um, as we move into the, uh, the, the 19th and 20th century, um, often became known through these metaphors. So the body of Francisco Pizarro in the Lima Cathedral, uh, the site of Machu Picchu, uh, were, were, were able to carry uh, a lot of the values that people were, were uh, playing around with uh, in terms of, of what, what the, the conquest meant. Um, by tying American anthropological approaches to the Incas to that, I wanted to show that, that also we should really be mindful of the things we carry forward from that history. There's some very unpleasant legacies that we need to be really honest about uh, as, as we're thinking through uh, new work. Um, from there, I went into two, two separate chapters that are kind of the deep time history of, the, of Iberia and the Andes. Uh, and so I did a chapter that, that looked at um, uh, kind of where the Incas fit within the Andean world, uh, what, what they said their place was in the world, um, and, and then I compared that with uh, the crown of Spain, which was basically uh, united and then became a thing uh, only a couple of, uh, I, mean, I, I guess we could say less than a few decades before uh, the Spaniards arrived in, in the Andes. Um, so what I wanted to do was show that in both regions, the idea of the world's end and some sort of thing that comes after uh, what was important in different ways, uh, but also the political elites in both parts of the world position themselves somewhere bef between what ordinary people were doing in sort of uh, maintaining their own lives and keeping things going uh, versus these sort of religious ideological uh, views of how does the world come into being, how does it end? And the, the, this political scale uh, that says, Imperial projects help to keep the world bound together. Uh, imperial projects help to, uh, or, or in the, the Spanish Catholic case, uh, a, a Catholic world empire will help to bring about a better world through the end of the world uh, the, by retaking Jerusalem and bringing Christ back, uh, bringing in a thousand years of, of um, a peaceful life uh, on, on the planet. So setting the, both of those uh, regions up uh, in parallel, um, I moved into uh, a couple of chapters on how those empires grew, uh, the, the ways that they were um, still in development and, and uh, some of the challenges that, that they faced as uh, we moved toward what I call two, two roads to Cajamarca. Uh, so the idea, and, and some of that starts to trace uh, the Inca story up to uh, this unknown epidemic that kills the ruler Huayna Capac uh, uh, up, up in, uh, in Quito uh, a few years before the Spaniards arrive, uh, and then helps to contribute to an, a civil war that is just in the process of being resolved uh, when Pizarro and his men uh, come on the scene. And I also follow uh, the conquistadors uh, through the Caribbean and, and then uh, into Peru. Um, from there, I, I, I uh, move from the capture of Atahualpa at, at Cajamarca and talk about what did the Spaniards do to survive after that? Uh, why, uh, so rather than saying they conquered anything, uh, to say 
they found themselves in a position that uh, was fortunate that they, they were still alive and they had this Inca warlord in their, their power. Um, but how they determined their path forward, um, how they aligned themselves with the Incas, so the need of, of uh, the Spaniards to have the support, uh, the active support of indigenous elites, uh, including some Inca factions, and then kind of how, how the situation evolved um, from the first years as the Spaniards got to Cusco uh, up through around 1550. Uh, and I think a big point of that uh, section was that uh, a lot of this was accomplished through in indigenous alliances, um, whereas what the Spanish crown found was that the men that it allowed to go out or it sent or gave permission to go and settle in the Andes, they proved to be disloyal subjects and bad Christians, that, that uh, th they actually continued to do things that, um, and, and we could say that the Spanish crown was naive to think that they would do otherwise, uh, uh, but, but the, the colony that was designed on paper as Peru in 1529, uh, did not come into being, and 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 it took uh, the, the the crown until the 1550s and then into the 1560s to conquer the conquistadores, and then to to actually say, well, we need an actual model for for ruling in the Andes. Um, a big part of that is 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 these last sections, uh, which are uh, the the shift from Charles V to Philip II and and new questions with Philip II saying I am going to take Inca sovereignty I see myself as the heir of of, of Inca sovereignty and therefore I need to understand the Incas I need to understand the Andes so that I can rule over them the way that that I plan to do uh, and so so this idea of what would become of the Incas and then what uh, what Spanish administration would would look like. Uh, I present in a series of, of what I call here protracted conquests of uh, uh, conquering the women of the Andes and excluding them from the colonial system, uh, trying to conquer Andean landscapes, uh, uh, trying to know where people live on the land and move them into new places, uh, trying to extract revenue, trying to make the mines work. Uh, these are things that, that uh, took uh, decades and, and arguably they, uh, many of them weren't fully accomplished. And I, I think that's where uh, then the last part of this is is saying after the Incas, uh, uh, the, the Inca rulers, uh, either the line is ended in 1572 in this um, uh, performance that the viceroy uh, puts on in executing a captured captured Inca prince, uh, Tupac Amaru, uh, or or. Uh, after the, the point where people don't recognize the descendants of the Inca line, the Koya or the Inca anymore in the 1600s, uh, the Incas continue to be an important uh, part of, of Andean identity. And I think th those, I've, I've alluded to some of the things that to me became really important in telling the story. Uh, one is that, um, uh, th that this is a story where you can see uh, this entanglement of religion and worldview and, and uh, 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 political strategizing going on in these, in these two different parts of the world. And that there's a lot of, um, uh, while the, the kind of high order expectations and strategies are going on, you know, where the, the Inca and Cusco might have an idea of Tawantin Sui, of binding together these different parts of the Antian world, or Charles V might have an idea of to be Holy Roman Emperor or to have the permission of the Pope. Uh, to carry out missionary activities uh, means to be a certain kind of ruler on the ground. Uh, there, there was a whole other set of omens and, and supernatural forces and, and competing powers and, and, and religious narratives of the people that were in the process of, of actually making the world that came into being. Um, sovereignty was a really important part of this. Uh, and, and, um, and then I think a, a, a key element was really tracing the Incas where not just uh, to being Incas in exile and people that are living in Vilcabamba until the Spaniards defeat them in 1572, but a dynasty that lives in Cusco that, that, that gave up its sovereign claims 
uh, and uh, in, in the interest of maintaining noble status uh, as Spanish subjects. And, and, and in that sort of separation uh, of Incas being a Cusco uh, nobility, uh, seeing the Inca identity taken up into the broader world uh, uh, by charlatans, by uh, messianic leaders, uh, by rebels like Tupac Amaru II, and then eventually in, in the interests of uh, Peruvian ind independence and nation building. And then I'll say very quickly, uh, just to wrap up, um, this story, I think uh, reading it across uh, the, the first century or so of, of uh, European writing and some indigenous writing really showed me also how much uh, in the intervening centuries uh, between the 16th century and the 19th century, the Incas were retold. And so my current project is, is really trying to look at a sort of Inca lens into the uh, uh, the claims of uh, Western, uh, a, a sort of Western civilization story. Um, as, as the Incas uh, are, move out of maybe being part of a, a medieval model of, of this uh, Eastern other, what the Indies are, uh, to being uh, part of maybe a mystical story of, of uh, empire building because miraculous empire building because of uh, it, it represents God's will. Uh, moving into the 18th century and seeing uh, new new claims about race and gender uh, that, that are attached to the Incas. And finally, the Incas becoming anthropological subjects. Uh, and so, so that question of how you go from a world superpower um, that is it, it be, it entered into the field of anthropology rather than other fields that study empires. I know I've, I've talked about a lot and, and that, that also illustrates how much I tried to um, cram into this book. Um, uh, I'm gonna stop there and, 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 and thank you for your patience with that. And then hopefully um, that, will, uh, that, that, that will set us up uh, after Jorge's comments for, for uh, interesting conversation and questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alan. This was a fascinating presentation and uh, kind of a very needed way to look at um, these encounters, um, displacements. I would just briefly like to mention that Nila Benson um, is a uh, very touched also by the fact that uh, our colleague Nora England um, passed recently. I, I wanted to mention this publicly. Um, I just, uh, we just thought about um, her in the context of, of your presentation and that shows the struggles of people uh, throughout time and how um, encounters um, um, and displacements come back over and over again. So thank you. Um, Jorge, um, it's your turn. Well, thank you. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> a, a massive book, both in terms of size and in terms of content. Um, it's difficult to to uh, summarize and do it justice. Uh, so I'm going to focus only on a, on, on a few things and, and pose some questions. Um, as... did, you see it? did you see it before we ask you to present? <laughs> you might have said no. <laughs> no, I would have. I would have. I would have probably said no. <laughs> no, no, no. On the contrary, no. It's it, it was very stimulating uh, and thought provoking. Uh, so here are some of the thoughts that provoked in me. Uh, so this is a new history of conquest, a la Restal and a la many uh, other books uh, that have uh, particularly uh, focused on Mexico, Mesoamerica, um, that more than any other place. Peru seems uh, not to be a place for practitioners of new, 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 new history of conquest. So. This is, um, this is a, 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 a relatively uh, novel uh, uh, new uh, take on the conquest. Uh, it seeks to replace Prescott and Diamond uh, and the idea of Cajamarca as a turning point in, in, in conquest as, um, as Alan suggested or argued. Uh, so conquest turns out to be a long-winded process. It's not just one single event. It's not just Cajamarca and like Diamond's argument. Um, and the, the conquest is not determined by technological superiority. It's not an issue of horses, swords, or even bacteria. Um, 
Here, however, I think I, 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 I would um, suggest something that I think is important and significant uh, and is the voice of Peruvian historiography that is muted or completely absent in the introduction that I found problematic. Uh, there is a historiography that is not cited. Juan Jose Vega, Incas Frente España of 1992, which is a synthesis of the work of Edmundo Guillén Guillén uh, and Valdemar Espinosa Soriano in terms of uh, bringing together all sorts of um, uh, sources, um, primary sources in archives, voices of indigenous peoples that problematize the conquest and the, the, the work of Valdemar Espinosa Soriano, his synthesis, Destrucción del Imperio Inca of 1973, uh, that should be cited as, uh, uh, as much as Edmundo Guillén's Guillén's Guerra de Reconquista Inca, 1536 to 1576, published in 1994, which is a synthesis of his previous work on a uh, compilation of primary sources on the participation of indigenous factions, Inca factions, but also uh, non-Incas in the conquest. Uh, so the book shows the conquest as a process of negotiated alliances among many factions, in which the Huancas, the Chachapoyas, the Yauyos, and factions within Inca empire in the north that is Quito, uh, Cajamarca, the, the region controlled by one of the uh, sons of, uh, um, of the Inca, uh, uh, that is Atahualpa, uh, and in Cusco, factions also in Cusco, play um, a significant role uh, uh, in the outcome as do cannons, walls, horses, or bacteria. Um, the new history of conquest, um, uh, has been practiced or pr practiced for the couple of decades now, probably more, uh, is non theological There are uh, a number of contingencies. Conquest is not overdetermined as Diamond um, does. Um, so uh, Manco Inca, for instance, uh, instance uh, attacking Cusco could have run Spaniards out and um, events changed only slightly. Although here I am not entirely sure, I'm not entirely sure um, um, because in the case of Manco Inca, as Alan described, uh, there are groups within Cusco that supported the Spaniards, Inca elites, the Cañaris, the Chachapoyas, uh, the Inca elites themselves, women, etc. So there seems to be a structural dimension to Inca weakness, uh, ultimately, that render it uh, um, susceptible to the type of conquest um, of conquistadors that, that manipulated across ethnic alliances um, uh, and uh, regional local caciques and rulers. Um, the book is very good at showing the logic of elite women as they uh, shifted alliances and confer power to different factions within Cusco, within the empire, north and south. Uh, but also once the conquest happened, um, uh, replacing uh, different uh, Incas for, for Spanish companions or Spanish conquistadors. Um, there's also a very revealing section in the book about the role of Africans, particularly in the, the rebellion of Francisco Hernandez de Giron, uh, who are kind of the civil war, part of the civil war, uh, or the civil wars that lasted two decades or three decades uh, in Peru among conquistadors. Um, uh, the book shows that the conquest is uh, um, ever negotiated, um, um, is divided in three. The book is divided in three. The first section is more about uh, ideologies of history and religion in both empires. Then there is the, the conquest itself, Pizarro's campaigns, Almagro's, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, the civil wars, a, a lot of a, a lot of um, back and forth, a lot of factionalism, Inca factionalism, uh, Andean factionalism, different caciques playing different roles, Spanish factionalism, uh, et cetera. And then there's the third section, which is kind of the, uh, the consolidation of Spanish sovereignty, the so-called religious conquest or spiritual conquest uh, and the rise of, of these uh, kind of uh, imperial model or project that wrestles power away from the conquistadors 
and is embodied in Toledo and his many reforms. So th those are the three, the three sections. Um, um, the, the, the middle section is very good at showing the fashionalism and trans-ethnic feeding of factions, um, all the way from Pizarro's first campaigns of 1825, excuse me, 1525, uh, all the way to uh, Hernandez de Giron, 1560s. Um, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, everybody is using um, one another. Uh, there are corporate factions within Spanish uh, groups, not only among encomenderos and among conquistadors, but also in uh, corporate groups, religious lay, uh, that is secular church, um, friars, um, bureaucracies, administrative bureaucracies, crown uh, representatives, uh, visitadores, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also uh, indigenous ethnic groups, chachapoyas, yaoyos, huancas, et cetera. Uh, in, in addition to the, the, the mess and factionalism within the, the, the Inca, the Inca uh, group that is regional, that is urban, it's city, um, it's a, a nature of panacas and lineages. I mean, the, it's a, the, the factionalism within allows for a lot of cross-ethnic, cross-factional alliance and realignment. Um, the second, the, the third part of it is not a, it, it, it shows a far more powerful um, sovereign power, namely Spain that takes over uh, in terms of religion, uh, religious conquest as it were, and in terms of a um, control of the landscape with the Toledan reforms and the mining reforms and the uh, reducciones, etc. I'm not sure that that, uh, that that was, I think that it was as messy as the first, uh, as the second, third. Um, I'm not sure that the Spanish were all, all that dominant in any of, 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 of those processes either. Um, uh, so um, the, the indigenous logic in the chapters um, of Toledo reforms is not as sharp. Uh, how was the spread of Catholicism also part of alliances with indigenous lords, commoners, women in different factions of the church against lords uh, and encomenderos? The Inquisition was a tool of commoners and women against lords, as many trials show. Uh, so the, the, all these factions are using institutions of the church and uh, uh, cathedral chapters and uh, um, magistrates and courts, that is the audiencias of cathedral chapters, also uh, to, to uh, shop around for, um, uh, for better deals. Um, so uh, there were forces within communities. So the, the, the section on reducciones, for instance, seems to be an imposition from the top down. Uh, I'm not that sure. Uh, there were forces within communities promoting the creation of towns as part of mobilization of commoners yeah, and in the pursuit of ethnic homogeneity. So reducciones and Toledan reducciones was also a, a bottom-up phenomenon, um, I would say. Um, the book takes the Inca as the core of the indigenous history. We'll get little on other perspectives, the logic of the Huanca, the Chachapoyas, the Yaoyos, the Cañaris. They are there, uh, but this is a book about the Incas mostly. Uh, the book goes over a parallel history of Inca and Spanish history and ideologies of expansion, um, religion and discourses of apocalypse and prophecy are central to the first, excuse me, the first quarter, or excuse me, the first third. Um, it justifies the title. Uh, apocalypse and prophecy do inform both the Spanish idea, a Inca and Spanish ideas of history. Um, and, uh, and that is very well, very well, um, um, presented. Uh, apocalypse and prophecy kind of um, uh, blurred away in the, in the middle third and we and reappear again a little bit in the third, third uh, but they, 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 they are no longer, it's unclear in the argument how apocalypse and prophecy 
play a significant role in colonization, conquest, um, administration as they do in the first in the first third. Um, and here um, um, is where um, Alan's contribution as an archaeology archaeologist is, 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 is very, very interesting because in the first third of the book, she shows that the Incas um, manipulated uh, historical accounts, that there is a kind of a gap between archaeological evidence and what the Incas said about their own history. And so it was a lot of propaganda and self-aggrandizing when you compare their accounts of uh, their origin, uh, their evolution, and what the archaeological evidence actually shows. But that is the only part of the book where uh, archaeology makes an appearance. And I was wondering whether archaeology has, there's there any, 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 any room for archaeology in, in the analysis of the conquest itself, in the study of, I don't know, the, the different locations where the conquest is happening uh, in, the, in the second, third, uh, like, I don't know, Cajamarca or uh, um, uh, Jauja or Pachacama or Cusco itself, uh, that are locations um, um, that I suppose have archaeological data that could shed light on, on, on whether the historical accounts are accurate or, or just manipulations, imperial manipulations or self aggrandizing manipulations or whatever. Um, manipulations, uh, uh, accounts by witnesses that are biases, which leads me to the last uh, part of my intervention, which is um, uh, the nature of history itself. Uh, the book is very good at showing throughout how players use history, historical narratives to um, cre create effects and, and, and manip present their, their, their views and their agendas in these factionalist uh, politics uh, in the best light possible. Uh, and, and it's, it's that that is, demands um, a methodological self-reflection because uh, the book draws on, on, on provanzas and draws on informaciones and draws on um, litigation cases from all over the archive of both Simancas and, and Archivo General de Indies uh, without uh, explaining why, why certain accounts uh, are more reliable than others, why, why um, Betanzos that shows throughout is really more reliable than Sarmientos or um, any other, or Ciesa de Leon, or any other account that brings to very different Inca perspectives or, or different factions of, 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 of the Incas. So, so why to, to privilege some accounts um, of Inca elites over other accounts when it comes to reconstructing uh, the participation of, uh, of factions, uh, the participation of other peoples, Cañaris, Chachapoyas, Yaoyos, et cetera, um, um, that if we use and privilege some other, other, as, other sections of the archive, uh, could be could be very different. So they, they are contradictory um, because because the accounts come out of this factionalist um, struggle all over uh, the 16th century. So those are my my queries, my perspective, and my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. I think um, because of time issues, um, I would like to, before Alan uh, uh, responds, I see that Jose Carlos and, and Julia said they had questions and, and or comments. And we also have um, two uh, questions in, from Facebook. So um, um, we hope to have time for all of them. Uh, so let's, um, let's, um, get your questions and then um, we can read the questions of uh, Facebook that one comes from um, Ishtar Shel Koshiren, who is also a professor here at UT and, and David Cañarte from Ecuador. So Jose Carlos, would you like to start? Or go ahead, Julia. 
Okay, sure, I can start. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Dr. Covey. Um, first, I want to start just with a brief comment. Um, I just wanted to say how much I really uh, enjoyed the book. Um, I really liked the framing of the book in terms of apocalypse, not really as the end of the world, but as the transformation of it. And I thought it was really interesting to think about how Spaniards and Incas both had their own understandings of an imminent or an, an imminent uh, apocalypse. And as an archaeologist myself, I found the first few chapters particularly interesting um, as you're kind of setting up the background of the Incas and the Spaniards in parallel. And so I thought it, it really feels kind of like a comparative anthropological approach to expansionist states. Um, and it kind of puts the Incas and Spaniards on equal footing uh, with each other rather than approaching them as fundamental opposites. Um, I also personally thought the kind of deep dive into Spanish worldviews, religion, and views of the supernatural was really intriguing and uh, illuminating to contextualize Spanish colonialism. So uh, my question really comes out of my own curiosity as to why the Incas lost at, at uh, Cajamarca. Um, so as you write in your book, the Spaniards themselves were pretty shocked by their own success at Cajamarca and they really didn't expect it. Um, and they even called it a miracle. Uh, but of course, in reality, the Spaniards very survival in the Andes developed, uh, depended heavily on indigenous sympathizers and they exploited existing factionalism among the Incas for their own gains. So my question is, uh, to what extent was the existing fragmentation and division that was occurring throughout Tawantinsuyu uh, in the wake of the Inca Civil War necessary for Spanish victory uh, at Cajamarca? Or in other words, would the trajectory of Spanish and Andean interactions have been different if the Spaniards had encountered a more unified Tawantinsuyu? And I can put that in the chat. Yeah, do, you mind you. If we take, do you mind if we take the other questions, Alan, or you prefer to answer them? Yeah, so Jose Carlos. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, um, and you know, uh, congratulations, Alan, on your book. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, I have a few questions, but I think I'm going to limit myself to one in the interest of, of, of time. Um, and this one has to do with, um, as you point out, right, I mean, um, part of the historiography that was produced in Peru was um, very much dominated by the national or nationalistic paradigm, right, where the necessary outcome of some of these clashes was sort of an Inca versus Spaniard view, right? And what got sort of lost in some of those analyses was the fact that the Inca themselves were a conquering superpower, right? So I think that this is providing a really good kind of uh, counterpoint, right, to, to some of the local histories uh, that, again, for some reason, lose sight of the fact that here we're talking about, again, two uh, conquering powers whose uh, you know, effects on common people, as you mentioned, right, could be, could be severe. Um, now, the argument that was posed, say, in the 90s by many ethnic historians was that although we could compare these empires, right, in terms of uh, how much they uh, are willing or able to intervene in people's everyday lives, conquer people's everyday lives, the argument that was posed was that one significant difference, one substantial difference, was that the Inca were somewhat closer in terms of their practices, right, their worldviews, et cetera. Um, somebody mentioned the uh, taxation system, for instance, in the chat. They were closer to, the, to their subjects than the Spaniards were, right? And hence from that, the argument that was, was then made was that their conquest was somewhat less disruptive, right? So I just wanted to kind of uh, hear what kind of your, your reaction to those arguments, uh, you know, after reading the book um, uh, is, right? Can we really say, that perhaps, again, there's some kind of common matrix there between Inca and their subjects that perhaps was uh, not present in the case of the Spaniards, or is this something that uh, is perhaps sort of a false argument uh, in the end, right? Thank you. Alan, let me read you. Your memory is not going to be able to retain all these questions, but let me just read their brief questions. Um, Ijaxel says, um, how did the tribute system originate among the Incas and how did it change after the Spanish invasion? And the other question comes from David Cañarte who wants to know the role of Rumiñawi 
um, because his understanding of Rumiñahui's role in history comes from a nationalistic reading of history in Ecuador. So he wants to know how you treat this figure in your book. Those are the two questions. Okay, and I've, sorry, go ahead, Jorge. No, and it's not only Rumiñahui and Ecuador's Keys Keys and there's the, the Calicuchima and many others from the north, yeah. I am from Ecuador too, so. I know. <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Jorge, for for your comments. Uh, I, I think um, uh, I think Jorge really illustrates just how uh, I'll step back and say you know, he held up that book stop of a of, of a, I mean, I mean doorstop of a book, and my my editor at Oxford University Press was indulgent, and I was able to go. Uh, 50% beyond the word count. It's, it's about 220,000 words, but it's not enough. Uh, and and, and they're, they're, so I'm thankful that there's no medievalist uh, in, in the audience to tell me how much more could be done uh, in, in terms of the Iberian side of apocalypse. Um, I, I think you're 100% you're on, uh, Jorge, with the things that this book doesn't do or that it could do better. Um, for me, that was, a, I would say, the, the, the terrifying part of wrapping this up was knowing that it couldn't do justice to everything. And, and there was the, the, all of this constant, like, I need to put more in, I need to put more in. Uh, in part, I think that, um, Jorge, you described so many book projects that where, where I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be working on this book. There are like four, four or five other books. Um, that uh, and, and I, there, there's just that problem of scale, and I think that um, and, and the scale shifts uh, along the the telling, um, so that trying to find a voice for individual people or trying to represent non-Inca people and what they're doing and trying to uh, trying to keep track with okay, there are things going on in Europe at the same time. Um, it, it, the, the, there was. It was really trying to thread a bunch of different needles simultaneously, and and I, I would say probably my the thing I wish if I had another I'm not sure that I'd be willing to take like the the, the medieval chapter out to talk about Iberia um, because I, I wanted that long durée picture. But if I had more space, I think um, um, interacting with Peruvian historiography um, and and then I think the the indigenous studies side of this. Um, but I think you, you could say for any one of those chapters, um, in some ways it, it, it would be saying, well, you should read um, um, this person because they have a whole book on this that, that, that I'm, I'm just citing right here. So um, it's a reminder of how this is not a comprehensive story of, of what happened and, and that, that, that it, it, it too is shaping a narrative um, and I think I think another really important thing is is I, I think that's a that's a good point that um, the historiographic underpinnings uh, aren't something that are, that are on the surface of this. So there are places where where I think I, I'm saying okay, here's when the Spaniards start to be interested in narrative histories of the Inca, or here's where um, uh, the, here's what Sarmiento de Gamboa is doing within this project of making the Incas into tyrants. Uh, so that their claims can be dismissed. Um, but but there is, I think that's one of the biggest challenges and that gets into um, uh, maybe uh, the way that the, the Incas have been read uh, since the 1960s, the, the low Andino approach, at least in, in, in North America, um, has been to basically, and, and I think that's something that I say in, in the introductory chapter is there's, there's a point in the 1960s where US-based anthropologists push historians out of the Inca world. And they say, the Incas are ours, ethnography is the, the future, ethnohistory, you have no right to be here. Uh, and, and then maybe I'm a good example of what happens, uh, which is the archeologists aren't necessarily going to say, this is how historians work. This is how historiography works. This is how you judge one document against another. And so it's really valuable to have um, a real historian uh, to say, 
these are things that could that could be in that that story that that um, people still need to know about. And I 100% agree with you. Um, uh, especially, I think I'm, I find myself doing a lot more kind of in the weeds historiography of how does this turn or how does this institution uh, get written and rewritten over 50 or 60 years and why. Um, but the, the, these become so entangled. Um, I'm, I'm working on um, the Akliawasi right now, writing up data from, from the, the installation at, at Wanakopampa. And they're literally probably around 100 sources uh, that write about that. Literally every European man in the Andes and a lot of indigenous men are fascinated by the question of what, what lies behind the gates of this cloister where women live. Um, and, and to talk about what they're writing uh, becomes so challenging that it doesn't even leave space sometimes for what they're writing. And I, I, think, that, that's, uh, in, I think that's one of the hard things about writing a book like this in this moment is there's so much amazing historical research on everything that to, to, to tell that story um, Makes it hard to 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 um, put all that all these different amazing projects and and, and approaches uh, into a single big narrative. Uh, and and that, in some ways, that was my takeaway from a reviewer that said we don't write this kind of book now um, because it's too macro. It's too it it's it's too uh, it. There's always something that's not doing enough of. And, and I think I would be the first to say on just about any point, uh, there's so much more to be said uh, in, in the existing literature. Um, so moving, um, I'm, I'm gonna maybe go through these in order. Um, and I, actually to, to um, can I uh, maybe, uh, let, let me go with, uh, through, through the, the, the feed and then probably Juan Carlos, I'm gonna have to ask you to rephrase the last part of your question because my brain is like, misfiring right now. Um, uh, so so to uh, the, the first question um, from, from ESL was on uh, uh, the Inca tribute system. This is one of the areas where I find myself being kind of a skeptic of, of the received wisdom that we have. And, and part of the, that is that a lot of the sources that write about Inca decimal administration, you know, where, where you have a, we have Quechua terms for this, like the UNO is 10,000 households, and then you have the, the Huarancas at 1,000, and the Pachacas, uh, the, the, the 100 units. But the chroniclers of the early 1550s, like Juan de Betanzos, uh, he talks about um, Yacta Camayoc. Uh, he talks about village people, one who has, uh, who is characterized by a village. Uh, as being the people that the Inca uh, are, is talking to. Uh, the Inca has his lords and he has Yacta Camayoc. Uh, and then Cesar de Leon is writing about uh, a decimal system, but only when the Incas summon people to war, saying you're gonna come up in your, your, your local costume and we're gonna keep you in order by putting you into these units. That doesn't mean it wasn't there because there are some tribute accounts uh, that seem to be read off of Kipas by the 1560s but what's important is Philip II, when he came into power, and, and again, he was put on the Royal Council to oversee Peruvian affairs as a teenager. Uh, as he's coming to power, he writes to leading Spaniards and he says, I need to know what the Inca could do so that I know what I can do. So as the sovereign successor of, of the Inca, he's asking pointed questions. Who owned the property? Um, who owned the herds? Uh, who owns, uh, and, and so these things, who owns the mines? Who owns the coca fields? Uh, what does the sovereign own? And what do local people own? And, and I think in, in that sense, that's not to say that that stuff didn't exist. I don't think that there's good evidence of decimal administration across the Andes. So there are a lot of areas where there, there isn't any evidence that the Incas were using decimal administration um, as, as the, the kind of uh, local administrative practice. Um, but I think some of what we understand of Inca tribute is, um, is, is shaped by this sovereign project of we're wrapping up the conquest of rebellious Spaniards and we want to replace them with an administrative hierarchy that connects their sovereign, uh, bypasses the people that are in between, the priest, the encomendero, the curaca, uh, and gets to the subject uh, and gets the things that the sovereign wants from the subject, their labor and, and, and the, the products of their work. Um, so, so I think that answer um, um, 
I, I think that one of the distinctive things for the Incas was the um, this labor based system. The idea that the Inca would summon people that were that could mobilize their own social networks, and then say, "I want you to do these things for me." Um, but I think it's a little more fluid, like how they translated labor into products. Uh, it, it seems like from some of the quipus um, uh, that Alejandro Chu has excavated at, at Inca Wasi, uh, that. The, the, the tribute becomes kind of quantified and it, uh, turned into things once it's put into Inca storehouses. Uh, so there's a system of labor that transforms uh, human effort into, into things that then might get shaped into to, uh, wealth goods, craft goods, um, uh, staple products um, transformed into, into cloth and, and beer and the things that keep the empire going. Um, I think one of the important things is is the way that the the viceroy who uh, who came in to um, uh, intensify uh, royal administration, uh, Francisco de Toledo, uh, the way that he started in Lima in 1570, saying we actually need to use the Inca system, we need to run through indigenous elites. Um, by the time he got to, to Cusco, he said we want to bypass the Incas, we want to discredit them, and we want to treat them as tyrants. But he still found it useful to. Uh, appropriate uh, Inca tributary language. So the Mita, which Spaniards use uh, to, to say every, every community has to give one seventh of their population to Spanish enterprises for low wage labor. Uh, that's a catch idea of community turn taking in, in community tasks. Um, the uh, Yana Kuna, uh, which, which are the Inca royal, we could call them in, enslaved uh, palace. Uh, I mean, they're, they're people that were taken from the provinces and transformed into uh, uh, permanent members, subservient members of the royal household. Um, the Spanish used that idea, um, especially after Toledo and during his tenure, where Spaniards would say, we don't have enough laborers for our projects. Can we rent tributary people under the name Yanacona? Uh, to come and watch our herds, to especially for commodity production, like uh, producing wine and and uh, and sugar, uh, and and so this is something that um, that's another thing that makes these terms harder to disentangle, is that the Spaniards also were trying to appropriate some Andean-like way of doing it, and to and, uh, to speak to the the uh, point that uh, uh, Jose Carlos was making, the Incas were also doing that where they're manipulating ideas of kinship and reciprocity. And they're, they're trying to pass maybe as the rich uncle at the party that no one really knows how they're related. Uh, be like, I'm really, really distant kin. And that's why you need to do these things for me. And that's why I'm throwing the party. Uh, that that, um, that the, the Incas in, at, at times pretended to be sort of just folks like other Andean people. Like we're out here plowing this maize field. Um, Except if you listen to what we're singing, we're disemboweling the earth and you feel like you should be feeding the earth so that she remains fertile. We have a different project going on, but, but, but we are performing uh, something that is, is seen as essentially Andean. Um, I think I'll stop there, but Isha, I would love to talk more about it since we're in the same department. So at some point, it would be great to have coffee and, and uh, maybe also compare uh, 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 some, some of the uh, pre-Hispanic and early Maya stuff that you know about. Uh, for David Cañarte, uh, the question about Rumi Yahweh, this was another really difficult axis uh, to keep in the story. Uh, the, the Quito has such an important story, has an important colonial story, uh, that, that um, the, the question of what happens to the, the descendants of Atahualpa, uh, uh, how, how as an audiencia does it fit into uh, what, what kind of uh, geopolitically then uh, becomes Peru or Bolivia. Um, there's a little bit in the book about uh, the convergence of different Spanish groups, so Benalcazar, Alvarado, and, and Almagro, uh, uh, on uh, the soldiers of Atahualpa that are left in Quito. There's a little bit on the sort of uh, Rumi Nali uh, burning the um, uh, burning the center, the Inca center at Quito, and and fighting against the Spanish. Um, but but again, it, it's one of it's one of these many areas. I, I would have loved to have talked more about um, Chile. I would have loved to have talked more about. Uh, there, there's so much more. I would have 
not only love to talk more about, but also to know more about uh, in this bigger picture, because it, it, it's sort of just trying to describe a world uh, um, uh, that, that um, uh, as it's changing, that, that it, it, I, I think it's, it's one of those things, thinking about this book as a model, that the more you aspire to describe it in real time and space, uh, the, the more elusive uh, it becomes, and the more you narrow it down into con concepts, uh, the more you you have to you ultimately are sacrificing the the resolution of the actual data and the methods uh, that we use to um, uh, to to answer. Um, Jorge, do you want do you want to respond to that uh, really yeah, quick? Yeah, and I and I think after uh, Jorge's comment, we're going to be having to close because we reached the time more or less. I think so. Go ahead, Jorge. Oh no! It's it's just it, I, I think this is it's, it's it's nicely done in the book how you show that in case of Atahualpa the Quiteño project when they are in Cajamarca uh, they actually use the issue of, of rescue of kind of the pressure uh, rescue or rescate project as a way to destroy the Cusco um, uh, that they had tried before and they had they, they actually did through. Kiskis and and Karikuchima. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that section of the book. Thank you. Um, so uh, Adela, how much time do we have? Um, usually we finished at like the fifteen for fifteen, but I think okay. we can go over, you know, few minutes, ten minutes more. So okay, let, let me let me let me quickly try and answer. Um, uh, Julia and, and, um, and Jose Carlos's uh, questions. Uh, so for, for Julia, I think that the question of like an alternative history, what would have happened if the Spaniards had arrived um, 10 years earlier or, or five years later? Um, we don't know, obviously, but, but one of the things that, that to me was really fascinating was how close Manco Inca was to bringing in the kind of gun, uh, not not the germs but the guns and steel and horses that that he was in the process of acquiring cavalry he was in the process of getting people that can make gunpowder and, and started to use that and they learned the spanish tactics uh really quickly so so i think to me if if if, if pizarro in sailing in the 1520s uh, i mean in when he when his starving men on their one little ship got uh, to Tumbes. Um, they found people that were curious and wanted to trade. I don't think anyone saw them as a threat. And I think that if they'd come back, people wouldn't have seen them necessarily. Some people might have. I think the, the Lord of the Island of, of Puna uh, might have looked for people that could be good allies to him. He, he, was, he was trying to play the Incas against, um, uh, like he, he had his own agenda that they might have fit into. Um, it's questionable. I think the other side of that is given that the Spanish crown itself said in the 1540s, we don't have the means of sending an army to conquer the uh, Gonzalo Pizarro and his men. We have to send a priest to try to uh, convince them to come back on, on the path of, of, of being loyal subjects. I think that acknowledgement, uh, the, the Spain didn't have the means of sending a force that would be sufficient to fight against the Incas if the Incas were a unified force against people coming in from the outside. I, I, I think that would be my take. And Jose and Carlos, could you uh, just, uh, th there was a last part of it that, that I, sure. I, 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 lost, I lost the thread of in answering the, the, these others. You've already answered a big chunk of it, right? By explaining how Inca hegemony, right? It, to some extent is based on this idea that we are people like you, right? That this is how they build uh, part of their, their hegemony. My question was, in a nutshell, right, um, your reaction to um, the argument, right, of many ethno-historians in the 90s that suggested that these were, yes, these were two conquests, right, but the Inca one was somewhat yeah. milder because it was framed within the same worldview, right, and I brought up the, the case of uh, labor tribute versus tributing goods, right, as, as an example of a kind of a milder, I guess, imposition of uh, imperial um, designs. Yeah, and I, th I think I think in some ways that remains a really important question. I, I, I don't think I can I can't answer it definitively because I think in some ways it's a question for local ethno historic uh, ethno history, but also a question for local archaeology. And uh, 
So you could attack it through some of the relaciones geográficas and see how people are describing who they were in Inca times and, and what the Incas wanted from them and see, see what the, the kind of uh, tone of that is. I think there are probably parts of the Andes where, especially with early conquests, where the Incas, by entangling kinship with this, by having Inca women become uh, marriage allies and then the reproducers of children that were both local and Inca, I, I, I think that there are places where it might be easier uh, to say Inca interests and local hierarchies align. Uh, but I, I think that there are also places when we see all of the uh, rebellions against the Incas, that, that there are moments where either, either those that kin making doesn't translate from one generation to another. So when someone says, you were my, my father was your father's marriage ally, you and I have to hash out an agreement, or I'll only respect this if you have an army nearby. Um, but the, I, I think that the, um, by Inca accounts, the increasing brutality uh, of Inca militarism and the, the, the convenience of declaring people as Alca or, or as rebels and, and then using that as, as a, I'll say, pretext for intensifying uh, in, imperial administration. I, I, I definitely don't see them as benevolent. And I think that uh, a chronicle like Betanzos also shows that they could also be, that, that they have a narrative of racial superiority toward Amazonian peoples, uh, that, that they were, I think it, it, it's a potential problem to say, well, uh, the Incas are an indigenous empire, and so all these stereotypes of indigeneity uh, get put onto them, that they, they were good to the earth, or they were good folks, and, and they, they never did anything bad. Um, I think that that's one of the, it, it's not fun to write like a, a, a big history with no heroes in it. Uh, but I think that was also important that the Incas weren't victims or heroes, that, that at times they, they might have been heroes to some people, but they were they were the apocalypse to a lot of Andean people, uh, so much so that people were willing to die for people that they had no reason to believe in uh, and, and, and who had no real uh, uh, sense of, sense of uh, I think, shared identity. But, but again, I mean, that, that's a great question for like the next, the rest of our careers. <laughs> Well, um, I guess we're reaching the end. This was super exciting and fruitful conversation. Um, thank you very much to the audience in Facebook. And, and thank you to Jorge and Alan, Julia, Jose Carlos, Nicole, and of course, Paloma for, for organizing it. So 